Well, only those who have experienced ALS truly know the weight of that diagnosis. I got to sit down with a local individual who knows it all too well. Harsha unpacks what it means to be a caregiver and what it looks like to live with ALS. Take a look. With life comes loss, and the most painful moments the human experience offers is watching the people you love endure what no one should, one of which being ALS. Today, we're welcoming an individual who walked with his mother through this disease. Harsha joins me. Harsha, glad to have you here with us today. It is so nice to be here, Grace, and I appreciate you taking the time to talk with me. Yes, absolutely. Okay, well, for those who may not know you and your story and, and your family a little bit, um, let's set the scene a little bit. Tell me about ALS and your story and your mom. Okay, it's a pretty long story, mm -hmm. so sit back, relax, <laughs> and here we go. Um, <clears throat> it started off with, uh, we noticed that my mom um, started sounding like she was drunk sometimes. And my mom didn't drink, mm -hmm. you know? Um, but her voice was changing. And then she noticed that she couldn't pick up her right foot. Mm. Um, and she would stumble a little bit or she was having a little bit of a trouble walking. So she went to some doctors, they told her it's diabetic neuropathy, it's something that's natural, it's something aging, it's okay, you're fine. And then uh, one day, um, she was walking towards uh, a grocery store and she couldn't lift her foot over the curb and she fell, hit her face, um, damaged it very well, uh, swollen lip, they rushed her to the hospital, uh, did some tests. Again, they said it was diabetic neuropathy. But my brother, who's a cardiologist, didn't quite believe that. So he took her to the Mayo Clinic and they diagnosed her with ALS. And that was in February of 2019. When you initially get the diagnosis of ALS, depending on who you speak with, uh, we had a very brusque doctor who basically said, you are in advanced stages. You should get your life together, get your um, affairs in order because you're going to pass away and then he left the room. Um, and that was how he dealt with it. And my mom was shell-shocked, my brother was shell-shocked, it was very, <clears throat> not knowing anything about it, it was very upsetting, discomforting. And so my mom did exactly that. She put her affairs in order, she came back, called her the attorney, called the accountant, get all this. She basically went through an end of my life stage. Um, the ALS Association walked into our life. They kind of walked us through what was going to happen. They told her this is a death sentence, um, but how you live with it is entirely up to you. And it took a while for her to come out of that I'm going to die stage and go into I'm going to live my life the way I want to. Um, what happened was uh, they offered her, we went to the Cleveland Clinic, I'm sorry, we went to the Cleveland Clinic and got a second opinion and they offered her a medicine which she didn't want to take. Um, she kind of fought that part of it, just wanted to end her life. Um, and then uh, my wife actually said to her, if I could have one more day with my grandchildren by taking a pill, I would do it. And that's what got her thinking. She has two beautiful granddaughters, she has my son. That's what finally made her change her mind and take that medicine. We had always talked about taking my son to India mm -hmm. and we'd also always talked about her bucket list of driving a Corvette and standing on top of the Great Wall in China. So one day she came to me and said, um, let's do it. <clears throat> so we put together this amazing trip where we took her to uh, the Great Wall of China. Uh, we took her to temples in India. We took my son and my sister-in-law and my mom to all these amazing temples in India, but the most phenomenal part of the journey was when we went to Dharmasala, which is where the Dalai Lama lives, and it's at the base of the Himalayan mountains. And when you 
stand at the base of the Himalayan mountains and you see this amazing mountain range. And there's nothing but clouds and snow and then there's heaven. Mm. <clears throat> you feel so small. And uh, we had wheeled my mom's wheelchair as long as, as far as we could possibly go. And there's a, a beautiful, there's many, but there's a beautiful waterfall that comes off of these mountains. And she could see it. And as it flowed by her, um, there were little um, temples that had been set up by people where they could kneel and pray. And she looked at me and she said, I want my ashes sent here. And she was always afraid of water. So for her to say, put my ashes in these waters by the Himalayan mountains was kind of uh, strange. But she told me that these waters flow throughout the world. And it starts here. And I will be able to see the world if you put my ashes here. And so it was a... <clears throat> an amazing journey to kneel in this Buddhist temple, to kneel in front of the Himalayan mountains, to see God like I've never seen God before. And uh, um, that was our <clears throat> journey together. When we came back, she was pretty worn out. She uh, basically lasted about a month and a half after that, and then she passed away. Mm. Now, from the point where they said, okay, this is ALS, what does it look like from there? How do you possibly start to understand the way that your body is going to be changing? Um, sounds like it's your body that's changing and your mind is still kind of still there. Is that accurate? You're um, very correct. Um, the whole process, your mind is intact and you're just slowly losing abilities. Your, I think the word is atrophy. Your muscles are in, an, uh, in that state. You basically lose that tone. My mom was maybe 130 pounds, and when she passed away, she was 90. Wow. She had just, you know, withered away. Now, that was just a snippet of their journey with ALS. Yeah, the full podcast of the entire interview will be available on our website, sanliving.tv.